the menus that we see from the Ataturk's time especially, when he had some foreign guests, the menus again would be a little bit of uh, not really mixed, but maybe mostly um, French style. Um, and this was a sample menu that was given uh, the dinner given in honor of the Shah of Iran. So I just um, translate as wonderful beef stock. I'm guessing it's a consomme because it says Shahane you. That's the exact translation. Uh, and then they will have all these like uh, French style sauces like Shambaka or Barijul. I'm not really sure about the pronunciation. But, um, you know, they stuck to one Turkish thing, which would be the wines, just one of them, Ankara and Jesir, and then the rest would be uh, French wines. Another example is from here, and that was given, um, it was the menu that was given in the honor of the uh, Sw Swedish um, prince, I, I suppose, uh, Gustav Adolf. And this is also mostly French. Well, they have a börek at the end, so that might be the only Turkish thing. And then they have this time two types of uh, wines, Ankara Incisi and Çankaya Yakutu from Turkey. Uh, towards the end of uh, 19th century, with the establishment of those hotels that I told you about, Perapalas and Tokatnia, there were also restaurants that started opening up. These are the most um, famous ones from that time, and fortunately enough, they all still remain today. Some of them have closed, like a very famous restaurant called Karpich in Ankara uh, has closed down. But Abdullah Lokantas is located in uh, Beol area, and then Bailan is no longer in Beol or in Karaköy, but it's only in um, Kadıköy area, and it's still as it was. They didn't change the interior, which is quite nice, but they made a new one in Bebek. Uh, so this is the typical French-style pastry shop. And then Konya Leze Locantus just became Konya at the moment, and they just reopened again in Sirkeje. Uh, that's the relatively nicer one, got, uh, better than the one that is in the Topkapı Palace. And also, um, with the establishment of the Republic period, uh, cookbooks also became a bit important, and also food writing became important. And during that time, we have uh, three very important people that we uh, rely on, but their books combine the classical Turkish cuisine and also the French influence. So when you, if you have any of these books or if you see them anywhere, uh, they will have both um, examples from both cuisines. Uh, they were the first ones to write a cookbook with using the modern Turkish language. And among these, uh, well, Rashid Güral is actually, he is a chef, but then later on he became um, a cooking instructor at the uh, Technical School for Girls, the Ankara Kıstechnik. And um, he was actually, he used to work at the um, embassy of the Turkish embassy at Holland and also he, briefly he worked at the uh, presidential mansion during Ataturk's time. And then later on he became a very important cooking instructor and he was also a cooking instructor for my grandmother's because she went to that school. And also Necip Ertürk uh, was <coughs> very famous. He is actually um, known as like, the god of chefs among all the Turkish chefs. He was... Um, he became the head chef in most hotels, like one after the other, and he was the one who um, put everything into writing, so everything was actually, like his book could be considered as the main Bible for Turkish cuisine. Uh, but of course, it also has the foreign influences. So later on, there were efforts to sort of simplify and purify Turkish cuisine. That was uh, done by Nevin Halıcı. And she, in 1985, she kind of combined all these books and she took, she got rid of all the French sounding and maybe English sounding uh, foods and purified it into just classical Turkish cuisine. And her book is still available called Turkish <coughs> And, um, but there are some dishes that are still remaining from those times and that's, these are just two examples. Uh, well, supangle is completely uh, French and we still make it and we kind of like incorporate it to our cuisine as spangle, which is a typical chocolate pudding. 
And then hünkar bandi is actually a completely classical Turkish Ottoman. It's actually an Ottoman dish. But um, the way you make uh, hünkar bandi, the eggplant part, you make sort of a bechamel sauce. So this was, I don't know if this is true. I did a lot of research about it. Maybe you can help me. Um, during the time of Sultan Abdulaziz, he had very close uh, relationships with the wife of Napoleon III, uh, Eugene. She was a very beautiful lady, and she came to visit him in Istanbul. And um, so they were, you know, very friendly, on friendly terms. But um, I guess one day when they were um, having a lunch, the, the chef prepared this dish, which kind of combines maybe the classical Turkish, because it's a meat stew and there's eggplants, and then the bechamel sauce, which is one of the basic most classical French uh, sauces, and made this dish. And in Turkish, it's called hünkar beyande, which is like salt and light, maybe. That's, you can pronounce it, uh, you can translate it that way. So when the chef asked, hünkar beyande, this is like, my sultan, did you like it? And he's like, yes, yes, you know, beyande. So it's, it's the name uh, became hünkar beyande. So moving on to the actual classical Turkish cuisine. Um, one thing that you can do now is divide Turkish cuisine into two as classical Turkish cuisine and regional Turkish cuisine. The classical Turkish cuisine is consisting of Istanbul cuisine, the palace cuisine, and Istanbul cuisine, I want to say, including all the minorities in Istanbul because they were actually a very big um, part of Istanbul as, they, as some of them are the original occupants of Istanbul. And, and once they came into the Ottoman rule, they were able to uh, keep their traditions, keep their culture, keep their beliefs. Therefore, they incorporated their own culture into the Istanbul culture. So when you say classical Turkish cuisine, you can basically say the palace cuisine and also the cuisine of all the minorities, so Istanbul cuisine. And then the regional cuisine is all of the rest of Anatolia. Uh, so Anatolia is very big and there's many different cultures, many different kinds of food ingredients and cooking techniques. So all of this could be um, you know, examined under one roof, which would be the uh, regional <coughs> Turkish cuisine. Just to give you a brief idea about the differences between different regions of Turkish cuisine, um, regional cuisine, Turkey is divided into seven different regions, and every region is divided based on the climate and also the soil structure. So um, by looking at this, you can kind of see the differences. Basically, like the Aegean coast has the most healthy eating habits because they use olive oil in their cooking. They eat a lot of vegetables, a lot of different kind of greens, seafood, um, and um, fish. Mediterranean cuisine is also the similar, except if you move to the uh, eastern part of the Mediterranean, then they will have something, their, their cuisine will resemble more eastern Anatolian cuisine. And then if they're on the western part, then it will resemble more of the Aegean um, region's cuisine. Central Anatolia is all wheat-based and meat-based. Sort of similar thing goes on in the eastern Anatolian region because they don't uh, grow lots of vegetables. Their cuisine is mostly based on animal products, sort of like the Central Asians. And the Black Sea region is relatively healthier because they eat a lot of uh, vegetables that grows there. They eat a lot of corn. In fact, their main staple is corn. Uh, they even make the best cornbread in Turkey. And then Southeastern Anatolia is, again, uh, lots of meat. And um, it's flavored with a lot of uh, different kind of spices. And they also incorporate a lot of legumes in their foods. So. Just to give you some examples of uh, different types of food that um, is available in Turkish cuisine. Uh, first of all, kebabs is um, known to be a type of cuisine, or say type of dishes within Turkish cuisine, but it's actually a cooking technique. So this is one thing that um, most people may not know, uh, because you say, you know, shish kebab or kebab or something like that, like just Adana kebab, Urfa kebab, these are all kebabs obviously, but it's the kebab there refers to the cooking technique, which is the grilling technique, which is the dry heat uh, technique. Uh, in fact, you can guess it because there's also kestane kebab, which is just grilled chestnuts, it's not meat, so just you can tell by that. Um, there's different kind of <coughs> raises, stews, these are basically um, 
yahniler, plakiler in Turkish. Uh, these are more the, the juicy kind of dishes, and these are the type of dishes that are cooked at homes or sometimes in Estanto Countessa, in the traderman's uh, restaurants. And these are the basis of most of the dishes that are available in Turkish cuisine, regardless of whether it has legumes, it has meat, or just vegetables. And then um, pilaf is very important, as is, and also as a side dish. And white rice is always regarded as more valuable than the bulgur rice. And nowadays it's sort of the vice versa, because bulgur rice is much more healthier uh, than regular white rice. So those are the two kinds of rice dishes. And if you include ingredients like meat and legumes inside the rice dishes, it could be a meal on its own. Or if it's just plain, then you just consume it as a side dish next to one of these dishes. Uh, fried dishes is not very, uh, doesn't have a, a large, cat it's not a very large category, but basically uh, there's two types of fried dishes. One, the usually the vegetables that are fried as is. Or there could be um, the fried seafood that is usually beer battered and then fried, or soda water battered, not beer too much. Uh, the egg dishes are also have its own category, and among the most interesting ones that are in Turkish cuisine, uh, chilbur, which is this one, uh, it's poached eggs with yogurt sauce, uh, with some sprinkling of red peppers and melted butter, is an interesting one. It's actually a very tasty one if you haven't tried it. For most people, it might, be, it might sound interesting to eat eggs and yogurt in the same dish. And then this one is a very, very valuable Ottoman dish called Soanli Urta. It's uh, eggs with caramelized onions. This is actually a very, very important dish for the palace um, because every Ramadan, on the 15th day of Ramadan, the Sultan would, be eat, would eat this to break his fast. And although this may look like a simple dish, it's actually very, very difficult to make because the, the onions have to be perfectly caramelized, and then the egg white has to be completely cooked, and the egg yolk has to remain liquidy. So it's three different stages, and the person who can actually manage to do this dish to Sultan's liking would be um, moved up to, the, to become the chief of pantry, which was a very high-ranking position in the kitchen brigade. Uh, these are the lovely flour-based dishes. Um, in Turkish, we call them hamur ishtere, and I'm sorry, I can't have like the perfect translation for it in English. Dough. <laughs> Dough-based, flour-based, uh, one of those things. Uh, these are just some of the typical ones that, we, that are available <coughs> in Turkish cuisine. Uh, erişte and mantı are more like the pasta type dishes. Eriştes are just uh, hand cut noodles that are made usually in the villages. And mantı is um, like a pasta like dish that has uh, ground beef in it. Uh, it's usually boiled, could be um, baked and boiled. There's few different ways of making it and then served with a lovely yogurt sauce and some red pepper and also melted butter. Some people prefer to put a little bit of uh, tomato sauce on top. Börek is one of my favorites. It's actually, um, it's a very, very, um, there's no way to translate it. I think if one has to learn about Turkish cuisine, they should just learn börek as is. Uh, there's many different types of böreks all over Turkey, different cooking techniques. It basically uses um, yufka, and yufka I showed you in the first slides, that flat bread, but a uh, softer version of that. And it just gets fillings of cheese, mincemeat, um, potatoes, spinach, uh, sometimes in the Aegean coast, especially like all mix of wild herbs, which is quite tasty. And sometimes even in different ingredients like um, pumpkin. pumpkin and green lentils. So there's different uh, regions make different burritos, and they use different kind of cooking techniques because you can fry them, you can bake them, and of course, most important one is suberi, which is a very very <laughs> difficult one to make because the the yufka layers are actually hand stretched and then they're boiled and then layered um, with melted butter in between, and then the middle part gets cheese with sometimes um, parsley, sometimes just cheese. And it actually is not baked or not fried, it just cooks over the stove. So there's a special tray that kind of looks like this. 
and it sits on a very large stove that's big enough as the tray, and then once one side is cooked, it's flipped over to the other side and cooks on the other side. And then gyozdeme is a very typical uh, village dish that's just a similar kind of yufka with, again, a filling that's cooked on a flat grill. So this could kind of resemble uh, the cooking method of the Central Asian Turks. And then, um, Vegetables cooked in olive oil, of course, zeytin yağlılar is a very important uh, part of Turkish cuisine, especially um, Istanbul and also the Aegean coast and the um, Mediterranean coast that use a lot of olive oil. This is a, a very big part of their cuisine. And salads and mezes, this is just very general. Um, meze is like its own category. There's so many different mezes, but when you think of mezes usually, you think of Istanbul cuisine because that's where you see the influence of all the minorities uh, that are found in Turkey in, in Istanbul. Dolma and sarma. Dolma is basically stuffed and the sarma is rolled. So when you're using a sort of vegetable, then you 